On January 31st, 1921, a U.S. Coast Guard surfman noticed a ship foundering off of North Carolina's infamous Diamond Shoals. Owing to the weather, the Coast Guard wasn't able to board the vessel until February 4th, and when they did, the Portland Maine Gazette wrote, No man held her wheel. No hand stood to slacken her sheets or empty the wind from her tortured canvas and ease her death struggle. She was a dead ship. No living thing saw her end. How the ghost ship of Diamond Shoal came to be stranded there and what happened to her crew is a mystery that deserves to be remembered. The schooner Carol A. Deering was launched on April 4, 1919. The ship was built by the G.G. Deering Company of Bath, Maine. G.G. was Gardner Deering, a veteran shipbuilder who found financial success at a time when the trade of shipbuilding in the U.S. was changing. In an era of competition from steel-hulled and steam-driven vessels, Gard Deering continued constructing wooden-hulled schooners built for the U.S. coastal trade. Tilbury House Publishers writes, Deering schooners were built for hard use in America's coastwise trade, filling a vital need as the nation modernized and urbanized. The Bangor, Maine Daily News wrote in 1911, G.G. Deering in the last half century has built nearly 100 vessels and owns at present one of the largest fleets on the New England coast. The Carol A. Deering was Gard Deering's crowning achievement, the Boston Globe reported on April 18, 1919. The five-masted schooner recently launched at Bath is the largest vessel ever constructed at the Deering Yard, being 2,114 tons gross. Remarkably, the Globe wrote on April 5th, Deering himself managed the construction. The Deering is the 29th vessel built by the concern since the head of the firm, Gardner G. Deering, commenced to build. He is considered the veteran builder of the country, being now 86 years of age and having superintended the entire construction of the vessel. A wooden vessel that size, launched in 1919, seems an anachronism, but Tilbury publishers continue, although rooted in archaic sailing vessel traditions, they grew even larger, four than five masters, using size, speed, structural innovation, and ease of operation to hold their own against the future. In fact, the new schooner sported a particular innovation, as the Richmond, Vermont Gazette wrote on April 25th. The Deering has three decks, and no supporting knees were used, the beams resting on stringers and clamps, an idea which is likely to be tested thoroughly during the next few months. The use of a rigid longitudinal shelf upon which the decking sat was a revolutionary idea, eliminating the use of knees, supports made from naturally bent wood, and thus strengthening both the deck and the ship. The Bidford Journal of Bidford, Maine, wrote on April 5, 1919, the five-masted schooner Carol R. Deering, named for the youngest son of Gardner G. Deering, was launched Friday from the yards of the G.G. Deering Company, her managing owners, at Bath. She was christened with roses and pinks by Mrs. Carol R. Deering. The craft, the Globe noted on April 5th, is for general coasting trade, hails from Bath, will be managed by her owners, has three decks and measures 255 feet long, 44 feet beam, 25.3 foot depth, with gross tonnage of 2,114 and net of 1,878. It would be one of the last large cargo ships in the United States to be built with a wooden hull, and was the last that Gardner Deering, or the Deering Shipyard, would build. He passed away on October 23, 1921. Reporting on his death, the Baltimore Sun wrote, Mr. Deering was known by a fleet of coasting vessels that have made the American schooner famous. But by the time of his passing, his great ship was already at the center of one of the most intriguing mysteries in maritime history. At first, the ship seemed destined to be as profitable as other Deering projects. The Richford Gazette noted that when launched, the ship had already been chartered to carry a load of coal from a Virginia port to Rio Janeiro, a charter that the Gazette noted was expected largely to pay for the schooner. The voyage was a success, with the Globe reporting on July 3rd that the schooner had made the crossing from Virginia to Brazil in 44 days, writing that the first trip of the schooner was very satisfactory. And the ship would continue its very satisfactory service, making successful trips to Spain and Puerto Rico. But the ship's luck changed in September 1920. From its launch, the Carol A. Deering had been captained by William H. Merritt, a veteran sea captain with the Deering Company. 
He'd been captain of another G.G. Deering ship, the Dorothy B. Barrett, when she'd been torpedoed by a German submarine in August of 1918 and had been commended for getting his entire crew off safely. But as the Deering planned another voyage, carrying coal to Rio de Janeiro, Captain Merritt fell ill. Just five days into the voyage, he decided he could not complete the voyage. His son, Sewell, was first mate and decided to stay and take care of his father. The company had to find a replacement captain, and Merritt suggested a veteran schooner captain from Maine, William B. Wormel. Wormel was 66 years old and retired, and described in the Portland, Maine Evening Express as one of the best-known skippers on the coast. For many years, he commanded large five- and six-masted schooners. The Kansas City Time reported on July 22, 1921, Captain Wormel had not tread the deck of a vessel in five years. For a number of days, he considered... Then the tang of the salt air blowing up across the Portland Harbor, his home port for more than 30 years, tempted him. He was 65 years old. It would be his last cruise, he told his family. Wormel traveled to Delaware, where the ship had stopped to disembark the ailing Merritt, and with a new first mate, Charles B. McClellan, boarded the ship on September 8th. There was every reason to assume the voyage would be fine. Wormel was an experienced captain. The Deering arrived in Rio at the end of November. The Times reported that from that South American city came letters from the captain to the folks at home back in Maine. But the return trip did not go as planned. On February 3, 1921, the Evening Express reported some anxiety is felt here for the safety of Captain Willis B. Wormel and the crew of the five-masted schooner Carol A. Deering. The paper noted a report that the Coast Guard had found a derelict ship and identified it as the Deering. According to the report, the vessel had been abandoned and was in grave danger of being pounded to pieces on the Diamond Shoals. The National Park Service's Cape Hatteras National Seashore explains, in days gone by, it was the wooden sailing ship carrying goods and passengers that kept the nation's commerce afloat. To follow coastal trade routes, thousands of these vessels had to round not only North Carolina's Barrier Islands, which lie 30 miles off the mainland, but also the infamous Diamond Shoals, a treacherous, always shifting series of shallow underwater sandbars extending eight miles out from Cape Hatteras. Outerbanks.com writes, virtually hidden beneath the waves and always changing formation and depth, the Diamond Shoals are estimated to be responsible for up to 600 shipwrecks along the Hatteras Island and Outer Banks shorelines, earning the region the grisly nickname of the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The Deering was foundering on the shoals, and when the Coast Guard managed to reach the vessel, there was no sign of the crew. The Evening Express reported on February 4th, according to advice received by the G.G. Deering Company of Bath, owners of the schooner, today the vessel has been abandoned at sea and was swept ashore with sails set. When the life-saving crews went on board, the only sign of life was a pet parrot, which had been left in the main cabin. On March 11th, the paper gave a more poetic description of how the vessel was found. Sunset was drawing down the gloom of night on a Sunday evening when patrols from the life-saving station looked their last for the day across the storm-fronted shoals. The surges ran white over the lurking menace of the sands, headstones with relics of many a stout craft. But there was no sail in sight. The wide reach of sea beyond was empty in the gathering gale. In the morning, the deering lay before them in a grip of the sand, her canvas set and slatting to ribbons in the wind. Her boat gear hammered overside, her boats and her people vanished. All day, the lifesavers sought to reach her. Some of her crew might still be aboard. Time and again, they were beaten back by wind and sea, and it was a day later before it was known positively that she was an empty ship, stripped of all life, before she had plunged into the death trap. There was no mark on her to show why she had been abandoned. She was apparently undamaged until the wind and sea and sand had their will of her and slowly ripped her timber from timber on the shoal. The Evening Express reported on the 4th that the owners of the vessel said this afternoon that they could not figure out why the vessel had been abandoned, but expressed the belief that the vessel may be saved. But on February 7th, the Evening Journal reported that word was received from Norfolk Sunday from Captain William H. Merritt, part owner, who had been temporarily relieved by Captain Wormel, that it would be impossible to save the schooner. In fact, after attempts to tow the vessel failed, the Coast Guard destroyed the less-than-two-year-old ship with dynamite to eliminate it as a navigational hazard. The Evening Journal reported that the Deering Company advanced the theory that Captain Wormel and his crew of 11 took to their boats and were swamped in the surf. The mystery of what had happened to the crew continued to deepen. On March 7th, the Evening Express reported that another vessel, the steamer Hewitt, under the command of Captain T.H. Bicknell and with a crew of 54 men, including a second mate from the Portland area, was several days overdue. Although the Hewitt is equipped with wireless, no report has been received from her. 
More information came out in April, by which time the press had taken to calling the Carol A. Deering the ghost ship of Diamond Shoals. The Evening Express reported on April 2nd that less than 24 hours before being found stranded and abandoned, crew had been aboard the ship. The Deering had passed a Coast Guard lightship at Cape Lookout, so close to the lightship that she was spoken. The crew of the lightship reported that a man at the wheel of the five-masted schooner shouted to those aboard the lightship that the anchors and chains of the schooner had been lost in a gale. He asked the lightship report the Deering by wireless. But the lightship's wireless had been out that day, and the encounter with the Deering had not been reported. The report from the lightship offered another possibility. There had been rumors, the paper wrote, that mutiny occurred and Captain Wormwood had been made victim of foul play. The man who had spoken to the lightship spoke in broken English. The crew, except for the officers, had been Scandinavian. And the lightship had not seen the captain. The mutiny theory was given extra weight when it was revealed that in December, Captain Wormel had spoken to another captain from Maine while in Rio and had complained about his crew's discipline and that the first mate, McClellan, had been arrested in Barbados for drunkenness on January 9th after the ship had put in for supplies. Wormel had bailed him out of jail. Still, Albert Frost, a Portland sea captain who had gone to discover the fate of the vessel, found the mutineer's story to be questionable. If the ship had mutinied, he reasoned, the mutineers would have turned towards Europe. They would have continued sailing north, nor would they have hailed the light ship. Another stunning new development came in April. A fisherman in North Carolina found a bottle with a note inside. It read, Deering captured by oil-burning boat. Something like chaser. Taking off everything. Handcuffed crew. Crew hiding all over ship. No chances to make escape. Finder, please notify headquarters. Deering. Captain Merritt recognized the handwriting as belonging to the ship's engineer, Herbert Bates, and various handwriting experts declared the note to be authentic. This revealed two new theories. The first, that it was the crew of the Hewitt that had mutinied and that they had taken the crew of the Deering hostage because they needed a new navigator. But the second theory was even more surprising. Had the Carol A. Deering, in 1921, been taken by pirates? The Evening Express wrote on June 21st that five of the great U.S. government departments had expert investigators at work on the case. And astoundingly, the paper writes, The piracy, which was in vogue years ago on the Spanish main, is hinted at in the preliminary reports of the evidence at hand, and the opinion is also freely expressed, that the seizure of the Deering and other vessels, which are now missing, have been carried out by the devotees of Soviet Russia. That is, the opinions of investigators from the Department of Commerce, Treasury, Justice, Navy, and State was that the Deering and other vessels which had gone missing at the time was commandeered by Bolshevik pirates and sailed off to Soviet Russia. Bolshevik buccaneers! Because don't all good stories involve pirates? But the red pirate story lost its steam the following August, when it was revealed that the man who found the note, one Columbus Gray, admitted to government agencies that it was a forgery. He had apparently thought that finding such a note would make it more likely that it would be able to attain a position at the Hatteras Lighthouse. Pirate ships faked to fool all Washington, the Buffalo Evening News lamented on August 26th. No sign of the crew of the Carol A. Deering has ever been found. Their disappearance is still officially unexplained, and their fate a matter of conjecture. The speculation about <laughs> communist corsairs pretty much faded with the discrediting of the note, and still the most likely scenario is that they climbed into the ship's boats and were somehow lost at sea, though that doesn't explain why nearly in sight of shore no remains were ever found. Some people still hold to the mutiny theory, and some have even tried to tie the ghost ship of the Diamond Shoals to the fabled Bermuda Triangle, which doesn't make a lot of sense since the boat was seen with crew on board well after they would have passed the triangle, which is nowhere near the Diamond Shoals. The Hewitt also disappeared and was never found, but that has received far less attention because a ship that merely is lost at sea is less surprising than one that is found intact with no crew on board. There were other ships that also disappeared in January and February of 1921, but most of those can be explained by storms at sea, but the Hewitt and the Deering were last seen heading away from those storms. But barring some revelation coming more than a century after it happened, it seems that the fate of their crews has become forgotten history. And yet, those who are lost deserve to be remembered. 
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy. Check out our community on thehistoryguyguild.locals.com, our webpage at thehistoryguy.com, and our merchandise at teespring.com, or book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo. And if you'd like more episodes on Forgotten History, all you have to do is subscribe.